fellow members of the freshman class of the Champlain Institute. <laughs> Thank you so much to my dear friend Judy for having made all this possible. And I am so grateful that you and my dear friend Will Thorndike, who's been such a wonderful host all week, suggested me to Darren and, and precipitated this experience that all of us have had of learning together. This Champlain Institute was frankly based on an experiment. And the proposition was that it was possible to come to the most beautiful place in the universe, which is Mount Desert Island, and to gather, you can applaud or just bask in the beauty of it. <laughs> MDI is indeed Eden. It's, it's, the, it's the spiritual and natural center of everything that is beautiful in the world. And the thought was to bring some of the finest minds in America for deep learning and for a nonpartisan conversation and to challenge each of you to set aside your political preconceptions and to open your minds to the possibility of learning about American democracy on a constitutional level. And what's been so exciting for me to watch you learn from these amazing scholars we've brought to you is to see how deeply you've engaged with them. It was so exciting yesterday to see Kenji Yoshina, one of the greatest scholars of equality in America, fairly describe the arguments on both sides of hard questions from the constitutionality of the travel ban to the Baker's case, and to watch you, like citizens in the best sense, uh, someone tweeted that it was uh, like a rave for constitutional nerds, <laughs> and that's what it was in the best sense. You were listening hard and your minds were being open. And then to see you respond to Michael Gerhardt's beautiful lecture about the separation of powers and the founders' desire to slow things down and to make it hard to pass laws and to promote thoughtful deliberation rather than quick votes. For all of us just to be dazzled by that amazing panel with Lauren and Larry Rosen, to discover unexpected ties between anthropology and constitutional law, to learn about the role of metaphor and culture and time in shaping our understanding of democracy. And then to begin with that synchronistic moment with Ryan Lizza right as he was posting his piece, but then to see what a scholarly and deep account he gave of not only the role of the press in American democracy, but the role of transparency in American democracy. And I hadn't known before he suggested it how corrosive congressional transparency was. And to hear one of the greatest political reporters of his time say that it was impossible for Congress to compromise and deliberate because all of its deliberations were public was a flash of insight that helped me and you understand the question that we set together to answer this week, namely, what would Madison think of our current presidency, Congress, courts, and media, and how can we resurrect Madisonian values of thoughtful deliberation and constitutionalism today? This Champlain Institute will continue. You'll have another curator and a wonderful topic next week, uh, next year, but so will this project of the Madisonian Constitution. The National Constitution Center has set up a commission, as I mentioned, co-chaired by Senators Mike Lee and Chris Coons and Justin Amash and Zoe Lofgren that will spend the next three years continuing to hold panels and symposia and podcasts and discussions on this question. All of them will be online at the National Constitution Center. I want you all to join the National Constitution Center. Just go to the website, constitutioncenter.org, sign up and get all of this amazing content and continue to consider it not only your privilege, but your duty as citizens to continue this project of lifelong education and of thinking about issues on a constitutional basis. Uh, my job is to uh, engage you in thinking about the future of privacy and free speech. I've decided to take two examples involving the privacy, the future of privacy and free speech, both because the Supreme Court is going to confront them next year and because I think that it will be meaningful for us to have a conversation together. And I want to treat this like a class, conversation, seminar. I'm going to set to you two of the largest problems involving the future of privacy and free speech. I'm going to fairly as I can, describe the arguments on both sides, and I want to ask you what you think. And we'll discuss it, not from a political perspective, but from a constitutional perspective. So let me begin with my example of privacy, and it's a very real one. So this morning I had one of the greatest hikes of my life on MDI. I took Lauren up to 
uh, the Jordan Cliffs Walk, which Will had recommended, and it, you know it's a little hairy going up, and then you reach that amazing uh, precipice at the top overlooking Jordan Pond on one side and the ocean on the other, and you're literally on the top of the world. And if there's any moment where you're communing with the source light of the universe, it's at the top of the Penobscot Trail. And we're sitting there at the top of the universe just communing in nature, and all of a sudden, a drone appears. <laughs> And this buzzing, menacing drone follows us around, beaming its insidious gaze on us at the top of Eden. And this was a moment of synchronicity because I've been trying to think of the example that I wanted to start off tonight, <laughs> and I realized that this was it. Literally my greatest constitutional nightmare, to be at the top of Champlain or Penobscot or one of the great Acadia mountains and to be followed by an all-seeing drone. So imagine that this drone, which we happily escaped by getting back on the trail and hiding from it, <laughs> were deployed by the government to follow me for a month. Imagine that tomorrow the president said, citizens, to protect us against terrorist threats, we're gonna fly drones in the air, and if someone looks uh, suspicious, we will follow them, and we reserve the right to follow their movements for a month. And because things are really dangerous, we don't need a search warrant, but we're just gonna rely on if someone looks suspicious. And imagine that using this technology, the Penobscot drone didn't uh, just go away, but followed me down the trail, and then followed me to the show tonight, and then followed me later to the uh, to dinner afterward and basically reconstructed all of my movements uh, in public for a month without a warrant. Would this month-long surveillance violate the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which protects the right of the people to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures? And I'm going to ask you to vote on that question in a moment, uh, and then we'll have a discussion, and then I'll see if uh, you've changed your minds. But before you do, I want to tell you that that is not a hypothetical case because the Supreme Court is going to decide a version of it next term. In what could be the most important privacy case of the early 21st century, the court will decide Carpenter versus U.S. And the question in that case is whether the police are allowed to use a subpoena rather than a search warrant to collect someone's cell phone geolocational records and reconstruct his movements for five months, for 127 days. And he says that that's a violation of the Fourth Amendment because there was no valid warrant, which requires probable cause. The government says, because they were just aggregating the numbers he called at cell phone towers, he had no expectation of privacy in those numbers, which he voluntarily surrendered to the cell phone companies, and therefore no warrant was required. And in answering that question, we will have a deeper sense of whether or not the 24-7 drone surveillance is or is not a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So I want to take a vote. Remember, I'm asking you not, do you think that being followed by a drone at the top of uh, Penobscot Mountain is a good idea or is creepy or is unpleasant? I'm asking you, do you think it's a violation of the right of the people to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures? Who believes that month-long drone surveillance is a violation of the Fourth Amendment if there's no warrant? And who believes it is not? OK, good. There's a good mixed uh, vote. And I'm going to ask you to ventilate it in a moment. But let's have just quickly an argument for and against it. And then I'll tell you about the history of the Fourth Amendment. And I'll tell you what the Supreme Court has said. And then we'll vote again. Will someone please who believes that it is a violation of the Fourth Amendment to follow me in public for a month without a warrant explain why? I'm a law professor, so I can call on people. But most of you voted yes. So. <laughs> Will someone just make the argument about why it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Yes? Well, in your premise, I thought that you, you said that the reason why they were doing that seemed unreasonable. But if, in fact, this was a suspect of, um, of a important crime, I would support that that would be my rationale, that the government had some underlying logic, and it wasn't just as capricious as it was suggested. Good, so this is an argument 
in favor of the constitutionality, my hypothetical said there was no search warrant. So there was not probable cause to believe I'm suspicious, but there could have been reasonable suspicion. It's me, I'm looking kind of sweaty after the hike, and you know, maybe you never know what I could be doing. So you believe that if there's some kind of suspicion, reasonable suspicion, to trace someone's movements in public, then it is not a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Excellent, thank you for uh, ventilating. Well, let me just follow up and say why. Why is it not, wh wh why is that okay? Well, the extreme example of following you, I would, I, I, I wouldn't generalize it, but I think in terms of, of, of fighting crime, that there is a re, and, uh, and, this, and the Supreme Court example that you raised, that, that was what I was referring to, is that hopefully the government is reasonable, has some limits to it, but is reasonable in, in making that decision. Beautiful, and that's actually a great constitutional argument, because after all, the text says the right of the people to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects from unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And you are saying that if there's some reasonable ground to believe someone's suspicious, and in the Supreme Court case there was, this was an armed robber who was stealing, as it happens, cell phones. You can't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> You think it's perfectly reasonable and therefore consistent with the Fourth Amendment to follow his movements in public for 127 days or five months. Beautifully done. Thank you, sir. Let's please have the argument on the other side. Why does someone believe it is unreasonable? One of the remarkable Gerhardt brothers, I have to say, Michael is, is, is a scholar in residence at the National Constitution Center. Deborah is copyright guru in residence at the National Constitution Center. And the spectacular Gerhard uh, young men uh, are, uh, dazzled us the other night when Ben gave the most beautiful violin uh, performance that we've heard, and Ben is now violinist in residence at the National Constitution <laughs> Center. <laughs> and we're about to hear about why surveillance in public is okay. Um, so. The reason why I see it is not okay is the whole reason why the Fourth Amendment was created, at least from my perspective, is that it was not made so that people could uh, go into people could protect potential terrorists or criminals, but it's because we want to feel safe and we want to feel that we have the privacy that we, miss, that we feel like we need or that we feel like we want. And eliminating that privacy really takes away comfort and, yeah, basically just comfort from um, the U.S. And it's basically a, a thought of, well, you basically, you can only take the good with some of that, and that's basically how you can only take that. You can't have, you can't necessarily um, have that violation of the Fourth Amendment as I see it, and it's going to be like, oh, you'll still have privacy because necessarily you're not. You're being, uh, you're being uh, constantly surveyed. Uh, that's just. <laughs> Beautiful, and that was another great textual argument. You used a word that was really important, and that is we need to be comfortable, which sounds like we need to be secure. And that's what the Fourth Amendment says, the right of the people to be secure in our person's houses, papers, and effects. And just as your colleague emphasized the word reasonable, you emphasized the idea of security, and you said that when all of us have the potential to be targeted by buzzing drones and followed for a month, or even a moment as I was on the top of the mountain, we are not secure. We don't have the feeling of spontane spontaneity and freedom and autonomy that is consistent with citizens in a free society. So that's a great beginning to our discussion. We've had two great textual arguments, one emphasizing the word reasonableness, the other security. There's, I, hear, I see lots more hands, which is good. But now I just want to, we have to learn before we really have an informed opinion. I'm going to as intensely and quickly and economically as possible, tell you about what the framers of the Fourth Amendment had in mind and tell you about what the Supreme Court has said and then we'll come back again and uh, continue our discussion. So many constitutional amendments have a paradigm case that gave them life. And the Fourth Amendment is an especially exciting case to tell because it's the story that sparked the American Revolution. And it's the story of the general warrants and writs of assistance that were so galvanizing to the American colonists that when James Otis denounced the writs of assistance in 1763, John Adams said, at that moment, the child revolution was born. So that is how central these 
agents of tyranny were to the colonists. What were the writs of assistance and general warrants? The writs of assistance allowed the king's agents to break into the homes of people suspected of not paying the hated tea taxes and to search for evidence of their, uh, of, of their wrongdoing. And they didn't specify the place to be searched or the thing to be seized, so they allowed the king's agents to break into lots of people's houses and to read their private papers in the course of looking for uh, evidence of failing to pay taxes. And the general warrants uh, were similar instruments that didn't particularize the place to be searched or the things to be seized. The general warrants story that really got the colonists going was, was that of John Wilkes. He was a critic of King George who wrote a series of anonymous pamphlets called North Britain 45 in particular that criticized the king and accused his mother, the queen, of having an affair with a foreign secretary, Lord Bute. The king, understandably, was not amused. So he dispatched his henchman, Lord Halifax, armed with a general warrant to break into the homes of lots of people to identify the author of this anonymous pamphlet, North Britain 45. Eventually, they broke into Wilkes's house and found the printer's proofs in his drawers, and they indicted him for seditious libel. He was not able to object that the pamphlet was true because according to the British law of the time, the greater the truth, the worse the offense. So therefore, he was essentially dead to rights. But he said that because the general warrant that authorized the search of his house didn't particularly specify persons or places, it violated the common law rights of Englishmen. And in a path-breaking verdict, a British jury agreed and gave him a thousand pounds in damages, a kind of McDonald's coffee-like verdict of its day. The judge, Lord Camden, wrote that to search through someone's private papers without particularized suspicion is a violation of our most profound common law rights. And this case is so exciting to the colonists that they named towns and children from John Wilkes Booth to Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania to Camden, New Jersey in its honor. They have parties with 45 steins of beer to celebrate North Britain 45. And many of the revolutionary era state constitutions specifically repudiate general warrants. You can find those revolutionary era state constitutions on the interactive constitution. And uh, go home, remember there are two parts of it. First, you can click on the Fourth Amendment and see the leading liberal and conservative scholars, Barry Friedman and Oren Kerr, describing what they agree and disagree about. And in their common statement, you will find a link to the Wilkes case and you can learn more about the general warrants. And then you can click on the Fourth Amendment and see how the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 forbids general warrants in language even more specific than that of the Fourth Amendment, and you can compare the text. So this is the paradigm case. And essentially, if a search today looks like a general warrant, then as Justice uh, uh, Brandeis uh, famously said, it must violate the Fourth Amendment. But the question of how to translate the Fourth Amendment in light of new technologies has challenged the court ever since the age of the wires. So the most uh, dramatic example was uh, the Olmstead case involving wiretapping in 1927. And it's prohibition and the war on booze and the government puts wiretaps under the sidewalks leading up to the office of the most successful bootlegger in America, a guy who's making millions a year importing illegal booze from Canada. And they eavesdrop on his conversations and conclude he is indeed a bootlegger and they indict and convict him. He objects the conviction should be thrown out because there was no valid warrant. In a straightforward majority opinion, William Howard Taft, my new hero, I told you that uh, in March my pay-in to the wisdom of our most judicial president and presidential chief justice, uh, as well as our thinnest chief justice, because he lost all that weight after he became president, will be published. And Taft was a hero in insisting that the president could only do what the Constitution explicitly authorized unlike Theodore Roosevelt, who said the Constitution could only do what the, could do anything the Constitution didn't explicitly forbid. But Taft, in this opinion, is a pretty straightforward originalist. He said at the time of the framing, you had to break into someone's house and violate their private property rights to trigger the warrant requirement. Here, no one's property rights were violated because it was a public sidewalk, and they didn't break into the guy's office or his home. Therefore, no trespass, no warrant required. Nothing wrong with this opinion. It was a five to four decision, but it was a, straightforward application of constitutional originalism. We've talked about the methodologies of constitutional interpretation, and Kenji Ishina summarized them so beautifully. Textualism and originalism, precedent-based interpretation, pragmatic balancing, 
natural law. All of these methodologies point in different directions, and I want you to learn about them, and Taft was an originalist. Louis Brandeis dissented, and his dissent was the most prophetic, important uh, decision about electronic privacy of the 20th century. He had in his desk drawer a new technology, a new clipping about a new technology, television. But he misunderstood television. He thought it was a two-way technology where people could see each other through both ends of the camera. He anticipated Skype and <laughs> webcams. And his law clerk, Henry Friendly, said, you can't just look out of a television camera and see someone on the other side. Now, of course, you can. But Brandeis alluded to this new technology, and in remarkably prophetic words, he seemed to anticipate not only Skype, but also cloud computing and fMRI technologies that could read our minds. And here are Brandeis's prophetic words. He said, the progress of science and invention is not likely to stop with wiretapping. Ways may someday be developed by which it's possible without physically intruding into desk drawers to extract secret papers and introduce them in court. Advances in the psychic and related sciences may make it possible for the government to reveal our unexpressed thoughts, sensations, and emotions. At the time of the framing, a far smaller indignity, the general warrants that sparked the American Revolution were held to be a violation of the Constitution. Can it be that our Constitution does not provide similar security against technological invasions? A remarkable passage. The court in 1967 eventually embraced Brandeis's notion that it's possible to trigger the Fourth Amendment without physical trespass, but it did so in a way that inadvertently undermined Brandeis's insight. It said that the proper question is whether people have a subjective expectation of privacy that society is prepared to accept as reasonable. The problem with this test is that as technologies become ubiquitous and lower our expectations of privacy, our constitutional expectations are similarly diminished. So if all of us expect that when we go hike, hiking up the Jordan Cliffs Trail that we're going to be followed by drones, we'd have less of an expectation of privacy, and that would mean the Constitution wouldn't protect us against the drones. And you see it's the circularity of that test that the Supreme Court may have to confront next term when it asks about whether people expect that when they're in public their cell phone records are collected. There are two other cases. All you need to know about the main uh, electronic privacy cases, and then we can go back to our discussion. Um, a few years ago in 2013, there was a case called US versus Jones. And the question is, can the police put a global positioning system device on the bottom of a suspect's car and follow his movements 24-7 for a month? The lower court opinion in Jones, brilliant decision, was written by uh, Judge Douglas Ginsburg on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, who, of course, has a house here on MDI. And he's, he's not here tonight, but it was just one of the most beautiful and uh, prophetic and Brandeisian electronic privacy opinions of its time. And the Supreme Court unanimously endorsed Judge Ginsburg's conclusion that, no, the government may not put a GPS device on the bottom of our cars and follow our movements for a month. But the court did so for two different reasons that have important implications for the cell phone case. Five justices led by the late Justice Antonin Scalia said the problem was physical trespass. The police had to walk onto the guy's driveway and physically affix the GPS device to the bottom of his car. And Justice Scalia said at the time of the framing, any physical seizure that was intended to gather information would have been considered a search that triggered the warrant requirement. Four justices, led by Justice Samuel Alito, said it makes no sense to focus on physical trespass because, after all, the police could have gotten the same amount of geolocational information by subpoenaing the guy's cell phone records, which are stored in the digital cloud, that is, distributed third-party servers owned by Verizon or Comcast or whatever our carriers are. Basically, Judge Ali Justice Alito anticipated the case the court's going to hear next year. And he said, rather than focusing on physical trespass, we should focus on the fact that we do have an expectation of privacy in the whole of our movements, because when cell phones or GPS devices or drones track all of our movements in public for a month, they can learn so much about us. The trails that we hike, the people we hike with, the bars we associate with, the political rallies we attend. Our movements in public can reveal so much intimate information about us, said Justice Alito, that we do have an expectation of privacy in our movements for a month, and therefore a warrant is presumptively required. And then there was a fascinating exchange between Justice Alito and Justice Scalia. Justice Alito said, you need a warrant. 
Uh, and Scalia said, you're not telling us when. The police have already, the court has already said you can follow someone for a day if you're a police, if you're a, a police officer. Why is it not okay for a month? Justice Alito said you can learn a lot more in a month and if the police aren't sure they can get a warrant. Justice Scalia said the question is what do the framers think? Justice Alito said the framers didn't think about GPS devices. <laughs> there were no GPS devices. And then Justice Scalia said no, but there's an analogy. You could imagine at the time of the framing a tiny constable hiding under a carriage <laughs> and eavesdropping on the phone conversations in the carriage, on the, on the, on the conversations. And Justice Alito said, well, since you'd need a thousand constables to get the coverage of a single GPS device, they'd have to be very small constables or a very large carriage. <laughs> you see the strengths and limits of constitutional originalism and to channel Larry Rosen, the importance of metaphor in thinking about the Constitution. I mean, this is very significant. So they disagreed. There was a final decision by Justice Sonia Sotomayor who said, we need to rethink this whole notion that when you turn over data to a third party, you abandon all expectation of privacy in it. That comes from a case called Smith versus Maryland where the court in 1979 said that when I make a phone call, the police are allowed to collect the telephone numbers I've dialed because I've voluntarily surrendered those numbers to the phone company and I expect that they're gonna be recovered. Friends, I gave a talk at the Chautauqua Institute about uh, last week and I was talking about Smith versus Maryland and the fact that the whole question in the cell phone case would turn on whether the court would apply this Smith versus Maryland case to cell phone surveillance or not. And suddenly a gentleman literally sitting in the front row raised his hand and said, I argued Smith versus Maryland. <laughs> this, this was the lawyer who successfully persuaded the court to hold that we have no expectation of privacy in our phone records, and then the gentleman went on to say, but I don't think that case should apply to 24-7 geolocational surveillance, because you can learn so much more about someone tracking their movements for a month than you could from aggregating their phone numbers for a day. Fascinating. One final case, and that is uh, from uh, two terms ago, uh, the Riley case. The question is, when you're arrested, can the police open your cell phones and read them? Ordinarily, if you're arrested, the police are allowed to pat you down and open up any closed containers that you're carrying, like a cigarette package, and make sure it doesn't contain drugs. So in this case, the police wanted to open the guy's cell phone, and the Obama administration said, a cell phone is just like a cigarette packet. You can open it up when you're arrested. In a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court disagreed, and I, you know I have to be nonpartisan, but when the Supreme Court is unanimous, I can say in an inspiring, galvanizing, and convincing uh, opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts told the story of James Otis and the writs of assistance and the general warrants and said that the search of our cell phones can reveal even more about us than general warrants because our cell phones contain so much of our intimate activity that it's not true that they can be searched on arrest without a warrant. All right, you now know the major cases, the history, and the text, uh, and you have all the information that the Supreme Court will have when it hears the case next year. Basically, you know everything you need to know about how to decide the cell phone case, U.S. versus Carpenter, and I hope you can now see that it's an open question. It's not obvious how the court will rule, because the court has said that ubiquitous surveillance in public involving physical trespass requires a warrant. The court has also said that very ubiquitous surveillance in public that violates our expectation of privacy using cutting edge technologies um, might require a warrant. But although some justices have su suggested it, like Justice Alito, five justices have not squarely held that we do have an expectation of privacy in our public movements for a month. Uh, so now that you have heard the best arguments, I'd now like to uh, vote again. Having heard the arguments for and against the unconstitutionality of ubiquitous cell phone surveillance, who believes that it does violate the Fourth Amendment and is a unreasonable search or seizure of our persons, houses, papers, and effects? And who believes it is not an unreasonable search or seizure? I think I saw a few more hands saying no. Can, uh, who changed his or her mind? Sir, tell us why you changed your mind. Well, to get to your... Uh uh, comparison of the, of the drone, uh, I feel like that could be a cop on the street and the drone, the cop, could approach someone to see if anything nefarious is, is going on. Uh, that's what the feds did to Tony Soprano all the time. 
<laughs> and uh, I, I have one question while I have the floor. Do you know why so many main drivers don't use their turn signals? <laughs> <laughs> I do not. Please tell me. Because it's none of your damn business. <laughs> so beautiful. Can I please suggest changing the license plates? <laughs> I think that would be an excellent state motto, and a very good motto, actually, for the US Constitution as well. The framers felt precisely the same way. That's great. One, or two, one, one more question, and that, I, I want to do the First Amendment. We have to learn together. And uh, you, you know what? We, what one question on, on drones, then we'll be gone. So you covered secure, um, feeling secure, and you covered reason, but what about expectation? I so, like with CCTV type, what are people's expectations of privacy these days? And also, what can be corrected versus what can be researched or be admissible for? Two excellent distinctions. What are our expectations of privacy, and what about the distinction between collection and use? Expectations, who knows? The Supreme Court doesn't, because uh, Christopher Slobogan, a scholar at Vanderbilt, did extensive empirical research on what people's expectations of privacy actually are and found that there's no correlation between what people actually expect and what the Supreme Court has said. So the Supreme Court has said we don't have an expectation of privacy, that when we put out the trash, it will be not searched by the police. It turns out people do expect that and so forth. So the court has tended to generalize about people's expectations without empirical grounding. And the problem with the test is its malleability. Justice Scalia, in a case involving uh, thermal imaging technology, said the question should be, uh, is it a cutting edge technology not in general use? He said people do have an expectation that they won't be surveilled by technologies that are not in general use. But as the drone showed, t uh, expectations can change really fast. I'm really expecting that next time I go up to the title Penobscot, there'll be some other creepy drone. And uh, that could lower expectations. So that's why I think Justice Sotomayor is right to say the court has to think about electronic privacy in a way that's not tethered to subjective expectations. And when I have a hard constitutional question, I ask WWBD, what would Brandeis do? And I have no doubt that Brandeis, who insisted that w surveillance of our telephone conversations was impermissible, not only without a warrant, but it might even be impermissible with a warrant, unless the crime being investigated was serious and the evidence was highly relevant. So I think that Brandeis would say that regardless of what people subjectively expect, it is uh, an unreasonable search of our persons and digital effects to follow us 24-7 for a month because it makes us less secure. Um, let me, uh, I think I'll leave it at uh, that for now, and I do want to introduce the future of the First Amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there is no more urgent question than the balance between free speech and equality on campus and online. On campuses across the country and on Facebook and Google and the platforms where we live and communicate, there are growing efforts to ban hate speech, that is speech that, of that offends people's dignity and causes emotional injury. And I want to introduce this hardest and most, well, most controversial, at least, of all constitutional questions by asking, what does the First Amendment say about the ability of public universities and online platforms to the degree that they are state actors um, to ban hate speech? You've already seen that there's a wrinkle in this case. Facebook and Google are not state actors. And the Constitution says Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say Mark Zuckerberg shall make no law. And yet Mark Zuckerberg and his colleagues at Google and Twitter have more power over who can speak and who can be heard than any king or president or Supreme Court justice. But their hate speech policies are crafted by young lawyers in flip-flops and t-shirts in San Bernardino County and don't necessarily coincide with those of the First Amendment. But what I want us to do as members of the Champlain Institute is just to ask, you know, what would Madison and Jefferson and the framers of the First Amendment uh, say about the answer to this question? What would the Supreme Court say? And I have to be nonpartisan, as you know, but as in the privacy case where the court was unanimous, I have no hesitation in standing before you and telling you that if the Supreme Court were to consider today the question of whether hate speech can be banned on campus, 
we would have a nearly unanimous decision saying, no, it cannot be banned. No, it cannot be banned because speech in America can only be banned when it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That's how deep the protections for free speech in America are. And that incredibly stirring and rigorous test came from a beautiful decision by Justice Louis Brandeis, this prophetic defender of free speech. And it's a case uh, from 1927 called Whitney versus California. And I want to tell you about the case and tell you about the uh, framing era history that Brandeis was drawing about it and quote to you from it. And then you'll have a sense of why I'm confident in this constitutional answer. So uh, Whitney involved a woman who stood up at a uh, Socialist Party rally and denounced racism and lynching. And she was convicted under a statute that made it a crime to attempt to conspire to encourage people to affiliate with the Communist Party. She wasn't a member of the party. She wasn't asking anyone to attend it. She was just speaking at a Socialist Party rally. And she was convicted on the grounds that her speech might have a bad tendency that might persuade some people to join this illicit organization. The Supreme Court upheld her conviction, but Brandeis, in a path-breaking separate decision, uh, disagreed. And Brandeis had been reading Jefferson that summer. He'd read Jefferson's second, uh, first inaugural, where all Republicans were all Federalists. He read the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, where Madison and Jefferson denounced John Adams's efforts in the Sedition Act of 1798 to make it a crime to criticize the Federalist president. It was a remarkable law because it allowed people to criticize the Republican vice president, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and in fact, people were convicted of criticizing uh, John Adams. And when Jefferson became president, he uh, commuted some of the convictions. And Jefferson and Madison in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions said that the rights of speech are natural rights that come from God or nature and not from government. When we're born in the state of nature, we're all imbued by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And they include complete freedom of conscience and opinion. Our rights of conscience and opinion are unalienable, Madison and Jefferson believed, because when we move from the state of nature to civil society, I can't alienate to Judy my powers of reason. My powers of reason are essential to who I am as a human being, as a creature of reason. And therefore, I retain my powers of reason and opinion uh, so that I can give government the power to punish murder and get greater security and safety of the rights that I've retained. And Madison and Jefferson believed, therefore, that laws that try to prohibit criticism of public officials were a denial of our natural rights of freedom of thought and opinion. And on the interactive Constitution, you can find these incredible statements in the New Hampshire Constitution of 1780, which talks about the rights of conscience being the quintessential unalienable natural rights. So Brandeis is reading the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and he's reading Jefferson, and he's reading Jefferson's letter to Elijah Boardman, the Connecticut preacher, where Jefferson talks about the need for complete freedom of opinion and the ability to criticize government officials. And he's also reading Pericles and the ancient Greeks. So Brandeis has two great influences, Jefferson and fifth century Athens. And his favorite book is The Greek Commonwealth by Alfred Zimmern. And Brandeis believes that in the Greek polis, with face-to-face -face deliberations. Citizens were able to look each other in the eye and reason together. And just as we've done at this Champlain Institute, achieve a public reason and thoughtful deliberation in common that we can't know alone. So, uh, and he believes that only in small-scale communities, no doubt like Mount Desert Island, which would be the, quint the quintessential example of the Jeffersonian agrarian paradise or the Athenian agora, uh, can people develop their faculties of reason? Jefferson and Brandeis believe that we have a duty to develop our faculties, to educate ourselves, just as we're doing here this week, that we have certain faculties ranging from passion at the bottom to reason at the top. And by developing our faculties of reason, we can fully achieve our potential as citizens. And Brandeis also believed that the duty of self-education was not only a privilege, but a duty. And only by hearing arguments on all sides could citizens decide for themselves which arguments were conducive to public reason. And that's why Brandeis concluded that the best response to hate speech was counter speech. The best response to evil counsels was good ones. And that only by admitting all arguments into the public square could citizens fulfill their duty of public deliberation. 
Brandeis synthesized all of this learning into one of the most beautiful passages in all of 20th century jurisprudence, and I'm going to share it with you now. And Brandeis begins by talking not about Madison and Jefferson, or rather not about Madison and Hamilton and the, and the founders of 1787, but of Jefferson and the revolutionaries of 1776. Here is Brandeis and Whitney. Those who won our independence believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's a quotation from Pericles' funeral oration as translated by Zimmern. They believed that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you are anxious about the future of democracy. Some of you are uncertain about what is on the horizon. And you've asked me, what's going to happen? And I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know that when I read and recite those stirring words of Brandeis and realize how deeply they are inscribed in our constitutional constellation, to use Justice Jackson's words, how wholeheartedly Justices of all persuasions, liberal and conservative, embrace it. How central it is to who we are as a people, I am confident that American democracy will survive and flourish. This is one of the glories of the American constitutional tradition. It distinguishes us from every other Western democracy in the world. Europe is, a, is, is, is crying for bans on hate speech. There are pressures in the anxious democracies of Europe to clamp down on free speech in the name of dignity. The European Court of Justice has recently recognized a sweeping new right called the right to be forgotten on the internet. It comes from the French droit à l'oubli, or the right of oblivion, which is so French. <laughs> it's straight out of Sartre, you know, I want to be forgotten, whereas Americans all want to be remembered. And if we were in Europe, as opposed to in paradise here on MDI, and someone were tweeting, Jeff has gone on too long, I wish there were more Q&A, the talk is getting boring, I'd like a cocktail, it's almost five, then after the show, I could insist that you'd violated my dignity and demand that Google remove this scurrilous, even though perhaps true, tweet. And then Google, this is not a joke, Google would have to make a decision about whether I'm a public figure and whether your tweet is in the public interest and is relevant to a literary, scientific, or other public purpose. And if Google guesses wrong and refuses to take down the tweet and a privacy commissioner overrules them, Google is liable for up to 2% of its annual income, which last year was $60 billion. As you can imagine, a $12 million fine concentrates the mind, and Google has removed 43% of the takedown requests it's received in Europe for the removal of truthful but embarrassing tweets, including tweets about the right to be forgotten itself. So this just shows how profoundly and centrally America and Europe disagree about the right balance between privacy, between dignity and equality on the one hand, and liberty on the other. And there's much to be said for dignity, and there's much to be concerned about the emotional injury of hate speech on the internet. And any of us who has been written about and described in the public sphere, as Ryan was so vividly describing, knows the powerful impulse to demand a right to be forgotten and second chances and to suppress truthful but embarrassing opinions of others. But America has reached a very different decision, it's rooted in our text and history, it's embraced by our founders, it's ratified by our Supreme Court, and that's why I have no hesitation in saying that if the court were to hear one of these hate speech on campus questions, it would not be a close case 
the justices would unanimously say, no, hate speech may not be banned by the First Amendment. All right, there's much to say. That's a lot. I've just uh, given you a lot to uh, absorb. Um, questions and thoughts or disagreements or maybe even an argument that the, the court is wrong and that the First Amendment should be reinterpreted and hate speech should be banned. It's come from a place of ignorance, I have to say. If Google, if Google takes something down, is there a redress against the taking down of the tweet? Um, it's, mechanisms are not transparent. Uh, the, uh, there's a British site that collects the takedown requests and there are some NGOs that collect them but there's no formal mechanism. And basically, if you know someone at Google and you think that you, you want to complain, that's sort of the way it works. But it literally is, I got, have gotten a chance to work with uh, some of these people at the platforms. And they really are, it's a handful of lawyers. And there's usually one person at the top who's called the decider. And the decider is the person who's woken up in the middle of the night and has to make a decision on the fly about whether a YouTube video is making fun of the king of Thailand by showing him with his feet on his head, which is a grave insult in Thailand, violate Thai law, or whether Greek football fans can criticize uh, Turkish ones with hateful speech and they don't speak Turkish and it's four in the morning. And you get just the scale of the responsibility of these people is huge, and yet all of it is non-transparent and unregulated by the First Amendment. And Well, that's an important Brandeisian concern. Do we trust people who are ultimately accountable to their shareholders, who have a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder price, to be guided by constitutional principles? As it happens, I think the deciders are doing a pretty good job of enforcing as much of the American free speech tradition as possible in the face of overwhelming consumer as well as governmental pressures on the other side. Hate speech is very unpopular. Users really want it to come down. No one likes horrible things that are said about others online. And trained in American law schools, as many of these people are, they try when the law allows it to leave stuff up. But it is a profound constitutional question of whether you believe that the future of our free speech should be left in the hands of young lawyers who are buffeted by competing economic as well as other pressures, as well as by hate speech guidelines that track, but not precisely, the American First Amendment. So there was a great example of the innocence of the Muslims video, which a few years ago was a cheap morality play that criticized the prophet Muhammad. And President Obama and the president of Egypt said it had been responsible for the Benghazi riots and demanded that Google, which owns YouTube, take it down and that Facebook take it down. They consulted their hate speech policies and found that the policies allow the criticism of religious leaders but prohibit the criticism of religions. So you can't say I hate Muslims, but you can say I hate Muhammad. And the video said I hate Muhammad, not I hate Muslims. So they left it up. As it happens, later it turned out the Benghazi riots had been caused by other reasons and the video had been up in Arabic for months before. So it was a good decision to leave it up. But that odd distinction between criticizing religious leaders and criticizing religions came not from the First Amendment or from Supreme Court case law, but from a 27-year-old Bowdoin College graduate, I'm proud to report in Maine, who just graduated from Bowdoin. He was running the Facebook help desk. He got promoted to run their hate speech policies the next year because there was no one else there. And he had just read John Stuart Mill in a Bowdoin College seminar. And from Mill, he somehow discerned this distinction between religious leaders and religions, which is an interesting <laughs> distinction, although perhaps not one that Mill uh, thought of himself. And as a result, Facebook now has embraced this. And then Google copied Facebook. And, Google, and that's our law of free speech because of this great young Bowdoin guy. So I'm just giving you a sense of why it's really important for you to follow these policies, to learn about them, and to think at a constitutional level about whether you believe that it's best to let the companies make their own minds. Do you support government regulation, which has its own very grave problems, as well as raising First Amendment issues of its own for the government to tell Facebook, a private company, what sort of speech to allow and what not to allow. And then you add the international dimension, with France now demanding takedown of material that's illegal in France, not only on Google.fr, but around the world. Google doesn't want to obey those universal takedown requests. It's in a bind. It can say no and face ruinous fines from France. It can withdraw from France, which it doesn't want to do. It may create two separate search engines for Google.Europe and Google.com, and that would have interesting implications as well. Yes, sir.
What a beautiful idea. It's a great book. Lee Bollinger's The Tolerant Society. And it's a very Madisonian view. When you see about the deep connections between the framers' notions of free speech and freedom of religious conscience, the reason that Madison and Jefferson believed in the real importance of freedom of opinion was so that people could have tolerance from others who didn't share their beliefs. It was very much a right of free exercise of religion combined with a right to be tolerant of those who disagreed. And that's why they didn't want uh, compulsory support for churches that you disagreed with. And that's why they thought the freedom of opinion was a natural right. So thank you for introducing that Madisonian value. We've talked a lot about thoughtful public deliberation, about slowing down public discourse, and about the values of compromise. But they were based in this notion of respect for people who disagree with us that was central to the Madisonian notion and that seems to be in short supply today. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate the uh, founders and your uh, respect for deliberation and reason. And I share those values. But I'm really afraid of what's happening today because so many people are reacting uh, from emotion rather than reason. And what are the safeguards uh, given the, the, the nature of the media environment today where you know the right wing gets all of this information and false, you know, false information from one set of resources and progressives from another. That is such an urgent, central, foundational question. Thank you so much for raising it. Was Brandeis too optimistic? Were the framers too optimistic when they believed that by respectfully hearing arguments on all sides, thoughtful representatives could channel the passions of the mob into some sort of reasoned public discourse? The entire, I hear a cry of despair in the, in the, in the back, the entire, Madison, the entire Madisonian and Brandeisian premise is based on the importance of time. Remember Larry Rosen told us about time over space, and Lauren described the really important work that anthropologists have done in thinking about time and democracy. Brandeis said, in that beautiful passage I quoted, as long as there's time enough to deliberate, the best response to evil counsels is good ones. Today, there's no time. That's what we learned from Ryan. He, make, t tweeting his single piece and the president's advisor is felled in a day. Minutes before he gets up on stage, the next piece is posted. When we make policy based on tweets in the moment rather than thoughtful deliberation over time, is it possible to have some sort of crystallized thoughtful uh, public opinion? We said earlier this week, in America you couldn't have Brexit. You can't make fundamental constitutional change based on snap votes because, as Michael so well described, it wasn't that inspiring to learn that the whole system was meant to be hard to operate. It's a good thing that it's hard to pass laws because it promotes thoughtful deliberation. And he just walked us through articles one, two, and three and showed us why that was central to the framers' design. Twitter and uh, the speed of public deliberation are undermining that. So you've just asked a very serious question that obviously I don't know the answer to, but I do have to believe. It's almost just a temperamental uh, impulse. Brandeis was always an optimist. He said, my faith in time is great. And he believed that given the opportunity to deliberate together, citizens would educate their faculties and rise to the challenges of democracy. That's really why I think this institute has been so meaningful. I mean, this is a very, it's obvious, I hope it's been interesting and you know, fun, we've learned stuff. But to take the time here in paradise to come, and you've come every day, you know, five days sitting here, listening hard. I can see in your eyes that you're following closely these technical arguments. You now know more than you did before you came. And the fact that we're here looking at each other face to face, I think is very important too. Some judges have described the American jury as being an enclave of reasoned deliberation, as much as it is easy to uh, criticize when you have nine citizens who are forced, literally locked in a room together and forced to deliberate over time, most district judges believe generally they reach good and reasonable decisions. So we need to think together about ways of slowing down public deliberation, about making possible the kind of discussion we've had here in the public sphere 
and of allowing our representatives in Congress the space and time that they need to deliberate, creating enclaves of uh, privacy so that they can compromise and responding to the challenges that face American democracy, not in partisan terms, oh, it's all the president's fault or it's Congress's fault, but really understanding how profoundly these technologies have been changing the structures of democracy and how, and I'm summing up here because we got to uh, do that, how um, fervently both sides adhere to these principles. It's been so meaningful to me at the National Constitution Center to see Congress people and senators from both sides agreeing to co-chair this Madisonian Commission. And the fact that the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, these two great conservative and libertarian and progressive lawyers organizations, are both chairing this commission that asks, what would Madison think of our current courts, presidency, uh, and media, and Congress, and how can we resurrect Madisonian values, shows you how fervently Americans of all perspectives adhere to these values, even though they may disagree about how they apply in practice. So your homework is to continue to be lifelong learners of the Constitution. We'll have a different topic for the Champlain Institute next summer. Some have suggested uh, technology in society, science, there are all sorts of wonderful topics. But I want you, I urge you, I tell you that it is your Brandeisian duty to keep learning about the Constitution. When you are reading the newspaper, every day there is a new constitutional question. Is the travel ban unconstitutional? Can the, what's gonna happen with the grand jury? Can the president pardon himself? Don't assume that the answer coincides with your partisan beliefs. Do what Kenji helped us do and dig in deeply enough to realize that there are probably good arguments on both sides. It's probably an undecided question. Probably reasonable people could disagree about it and then you can make up your own mind. How can you do that? Just learn. Uh, do, do go, uh, I, I need to tell you, because this is what, this is my mission in life, is to convince you to learn from uh, our great educational materials, join the National Constitution Center, sign up, get the emails every week. People like Michael and me and the people you've seen are having these conversations. I have this weekly podcast, We the People, where I call up the top scholars in the country, liberals and conservatives, to debate these issues of the week. And just set aside like a meditation of 15 minutes a, a, a week or a half hour a day to pick a topic in the news and dig down into it, listen to the arguments on both sides, and make up your own mind. You will find yourself more optimistic, more elevated, and you'll learn, and we all know that we're most fulfilled as we get older when we learn and when we open our minds and we deepen our understanding. And the most exciting moments are when we change our minds or where we can actually sympathetically empathize with someone on the other side who previously we'd scorn. That connection, that feeling of brotherhood of, and, of, and, of, and of fellow citizenship is what it means to be an American, that feeling of toleration and of a common enterprise and of being united by this beautiful document of human freedom that we all share, and that is the US Constitution. I'm gonna end with the gorgeous words of Brandeis. If we would govern by the light of reason, we must let our minds be bold. Thank you so much for a wonderful week. <laughs> wonderful.